We then transition to the next scene, where we see that the Amal Kingdom is having a banquet event and everyone is dancing. Meanwhile, Skyla is thinking about how it hasn't been long since the queen died, so she wasn't expecting them to prepare such a lavish event. As she's fidgeting with her necklace, she is also thinking about how her aunt wanted her to dress up extravagantly, so she did to a certain extent. But she believes that she looks plain amongst this crowd, so she doesn't think she'll stand out. We further see Roygar and Garnet waiting talking to each other. Suddenly, someone says to them, I wanted to greet the guests who had traveled a great distance, but I'm not sure if I'm making you all uncomfortable. Upon hearing this statement, Roygar and Garnet turn around and bow towards the individual. He also states to him that of course not, and thanks him for his hospitality. We further learn that the stranger is actually the Amal Kingdom's king. As the king reaches out his hand, he then tells Roygar that it must be very upsetting for him to lend out his beautiful wife's hand. Roygar agrees with the king and mentions to him that, however, he's making an exception for him. The king chuckles upon hearing this agreement and mentions to Roygar that it would have been nice if he had a daughter. He adds that it's unfortunate that he only has a worthless son. We then switch to the next scene, where someone shouts out that the king and Garnet have arrived. Upon hearing this announcement, Skyla turns around to see them enter. As the two of them are entering the banquet hall, all of the nobles are watching them enter and are amazed. Garnet is also looking very beautiful as she's entering with the king. Meanwhile, Skyla is reminding herself about how she must get her aunt to slip up here. However, she realizes that her aunt isn't acting as she had anticipated. She also wonders what will she do if her aunt doesn't make any mistakes until the very end. She is further aware that it was the same when they met with the owner of the Felona Merchant Company. Skyla then starts to recall when Garnet stated to Felona that she understands what she said about Madame Rexon not acting in line with the wishes of the Eons' kingdom, but there's nothing she can do to ascertain the truth. She added that she would let her meet her husband. This statement shocked Skyla. She also started thinking about how this isn't good, as she believed that her aunt was going to be a little more shaken up. Skyla further believed that there's no way that her aunt's suspicions of her husband being responsible for sending Ford to the Eons' kingdom have vanished. She then learned that in the end, her aunt chose to put her misgivings aside and trust her husband. Skyla further starts to remember another memory of when her aunt Garnet was laying down in bed. As she was laying down, she said to her, I don't have a choice. He's my husband, and we have children. All I can do is put my faith in him. It's not as though he really cheated on me. I should forgive him this once and move on. Besides, he's much kinder to me now than before. I can't keep living in misery forever. Even so, I feel apologetic to that person. Upon remembering the past, Skyla clenches her hand and starts thinking about how this is a complete mess. She also believes that her plan was flawed from the start. She further believes that it may have been successful if the name Ford hadn't been involved. Skyla knows that, however. Her aunt recognized the unhappiness, which is why she won't do anything, because she's afraid that she might end up losing the little that is currently in her grasp. As Skyla sighs, she starts to wonder about what should she do. All of a sudden, Skyla looks out of the window and notices a hooded man running. As the hooded man is dashing, she starts to wonder who it is and realizes that something suspicious is going on. Upon realizing this, she starts to search for her aunt so that she can tell her immediately. As she's searching for her aunt, she bumps into a stranger. Upon bumping into the stranger, she excuses herself and looks up to see who it is. She realizes that it's Cardriel. Cardriel then grins and mentions to Skyla that she must be the lady from House Camellia. He also asks her if she would like to dance with him. Skyla apologizes to Cardriel and states that she needs to see her aunt right now. Upon hearing this apology, Cardriel tells Skyla that rumors say that she's a gifted young woman. He adds that surely she must have considered this. This statement makes Skyla flinch. Cardriel then pulls Skyla closer to him so that they can start dancing. As he's doing this, Skyla realizes that Cardriel intended to trap her here from the start. We then move to the next scene where we see Roygar speaking to the king. He mentions to the king that his understanding is that Eons has already briefed him on the situation at large. The king agrees with Roygar. Roygar then says, On a macro level, Eons' kingdom and I have arrived at a mutual agreement. Please make a decision. 
the Eon's kingdom will be able to completely escape the accusation that it was responsible for the murder of the queen, and I will be credited with resolving the issue that emerged within House Reagan. By eliminating your political threats, you will gain stability. However, this agreement was only included due to the fact that the late queen was involved in the salt business with House Reagan. The emperor places a high value on the salt industry, and he also had faith in Duke Reagan. If His Majesty, the Emperor, were to learn that another country was taking part in the business, whoever killed the Queen would become entirely irrelevant. We then switch back to seeing Skyla and Cardriel dancing. As they are dancing, Skyla is panting and requesting Cardriel to stop. However, Cardriel smirks and states to Skyla that she has awful stamina. Skyla questions Cardriel back about how much stamina does he expect one person to have when they've danced to four songs in a row. She also asks him if he has stalled long enough. These questions make Cardriel chuckle. He then tells Skyla that he believes he has demonstrated sufficient consideration for both her and Garnet. This statement irritates Skyla. She also questions Cardriel about if he calls this consideration. Cardriel replies, That's right. If you alert Grand Duchess Roygar that something suspicious is happening, she will immediately inform her husband, Grand Duke Roygar. Then, either Grand Duchess Roygar or you may be injured during an armed confrontation. This response shocks Skyla. She also asks him for more clarification. Suddenly, she hears a loud bang noise. Skyla turns to see what happened and notices all of the nobles panicking and running for their lives. One of the nobles then opens the door to get out of the banquet hall and questions the knights about if there are any guards. As the knights are approaching the noble, they apologize to him and mention to him that no one is allowed to leave. Upon noticing all of this, Skyla asks Cardriel what is he planning. Cardriel responds, Did you know? The late queen and my father, the king, had a hand in the Kratos Empire's salt trade. Someone must have overheard that the worthless son intended to inform the emperor about this. Isn't it truly unfortunate? Skyla questions Cardriel back about if that's the scenario he made up, and who would believe that. Cardriel asks Skyla if the story's consistency really matters. This question shocks Skyla. As she clenches her hands, she also realizes that the only thing that counts is whether or not the Emperor can make use of it. She further believes that the information about King Amel's involvement in the salt business is probably also true. Meanwhile, as Cardriel is staring at Skyla, he starts thinking about how Skyla's intelligent, and that it seems like that rumor that she's a bright young lady was not completely baseless. He also starts to remember that she's Camellia's daughter. Cardriel then states to Skyla to come find him if she has nowhere else to go. Skyla becomes irritated again upon hearing this statement and questions him for an explanation. Cardriel replies, You are not someone I can entice with a title, since you will become the Marquis of House Camellia in the future. There's no use in trying to bribe you, but if that doesn't work out, I'll look into recruiting you. I'm not kidding. There is plenty of potential for growth in Amel. We need a lot of competent individuals. I will promise you that unlike Kratos, I will not allow political strife to pointlessly send you to your grave and leave you there to fester. We then see the next scene where Garnet notices Felona entering her room. She also welcomes her and asks her if the talk went well. Felona replies, Your Highness, I'll be able to return home after completing my task thanks to you. It was all because the subject of significance that was brought up by the owner of the merchant company, instead of me, was also important to your husband. Upon hearing this response, Garnet notices a gift box in Felona's hand and questions her about what is it. Felona states to Garnet that as a token of her appreciation, she would like to offer her a gift. Garnet tells Felona that she doesn't need something like that. As Felona kneels in front of Garnet, she requests her to not refuse her sincerity. She adds that the king will reprimand her if she leaves without demonstrating any sincerity. Upon hearing this request, Garnet agrees to Felona's request and takes the gift. She then starts to open the gift box. Once she opens the box, she thanks Felona and notices that there is an engraving of a sun and moon and a message that says, Eternal moon, illuminate the world. We further learn that the patterns of sun and moon are common. However, the imperial moon symbolizes the empress, and a long life is a blessing reserved for the emperor and empress alone. The moon with three stars symbolizes Garnet and her children. 
Felona then mentions to Garnet that she's giving this to her in advance. It's to express their faith that she and Roygar will have a glorious future. Garnet thanks Felona. As she's squeezing the box, she also wonders if it's really all right to accept this. Suddenly, Garnet hears a scream which causes her to jolt up. She also asks what is the matter. Meanwhile, we see a bunch of knights stomping into the banquet hall with their swords out. We then transition to the next scene, where we see Cardriel questioning the knights about the royal guards. One of the knights states to Cardriel that they have subdued them and that the guard captain surrendered. He adds that both parties collectively suffered a mere three casualties. Cardriel tells the knights that he guesses they had no will to fight. He adds that it seems like they realized it's too late now and that there's probably no reason for them to put their lives on the line since they don't have a queen. As Cardriel puts his hand on his gun, he asks the knights about the Kratos Imperial Army. One of the knights mentions to Cardriel that a battle broke out in the port. Cardriel then states to the knights that the situation will become tough if it escalates. He also commands them to close the gates and prepare a strong defense. He adds that he'll go with a response from Roygar within two hours. Cardriel further questions the knights about what became of Eons's informants. The knight tells Cardriel that they are still in pursuit of them and sincerely apologizes. Upon hearing this apology, Cardriel mentions to the knight that they're probably long gone by now. He adds that they should forget it as they will likely return as soon as they have fully comprehended the situation. All of a sudden, Cardriel becomes surprised as he notices ladies blocking the door. One of the ladies then asks Cardriel if he really believes he won't face any consequences after committing such a rash act. Cardriel reassures the ladies not to fret. He adds that no harm will come to Garnet. He also requests the ladies to also let Roygar know that they won't touch a single hair on her head, so he doesn't have to be too surprised. The lady is speechless upon hearing this request. Cardriel then commands the knights to follow him and to not lay a finger on them. He adds that they are heading straight for the king. Cardriel further bursts into the room where Roygar and the king are. Upon the king noticing Cardriel, he questions him about what's the meaning of this. Cardriel ignores his father's question and starts to clean his ears. After that, he requests Roygar to accept his sincere apologies for dragging him into this. Roygar asks Cardriel what is this all about. Cardriel responds, I feel ashamed to tell you this, as it is a disgrace to my house and my family, but it's also not completely unrelated to the empire. You had to make the long and arduous journey to the south because an issue arose due to the king interfering in the distribution of Riag and Salt, which he attempted to conceal until the very end, while knowing that Emperor Gregor had explicitly forbidden it. Please accept my sincere apologies. Had I known in advance, I would have promptly notified the emperor and taken the appropriate measures. Roygar is shocked upon hearing this response. As Roygar is disgusted of the situation, he starts to realize that his plan is all ruined. We also learn that his plan was to advance the Imperial Army and launch an assault on the King's army and Cardriel before down. He further couldn't believe that there would be a counterattack. We then learn that in this situation, the Emperor will merely disregard Roygar's accusation that Cardriel is the Queen's assassin, since he does not want conflict. Furthermore, the Prince must have previously sent updates on the salt trade. If King Amel is presented as a scapegoat along with evidence, and Kratos is offered significant compensation, then the Emperor would be pleased with such a conclusion, including the fact that, rather than accomplishing anything, Roygar made a mistake. Cardriel then requests Roygar to retreat to his room and relax. He adds that when matters have calmed down tomorrow morning, he will pay him a visit. Roygar is speechless upon hearing this request. Meanwhile, the king questions Cardriel about if he really believes that murdering his parents to ascend to the throne won't come back to bite him. Cardriel states to his father that he does think about it from time to time. He also asks him about why is it more serious for someone to murder their father than their son. This question makes the king call his son a bastard. Cardriel then says, Please do not fret. I will neither kill you nor usurp your throne. Although, I can't predict what the avaricious emperor of Kratos will want. Upon hearing this statement, the king shouts at Cardriel that he doesn't know anything about that business. As Cardriel is smirking, he tells his father that he should at least know something about anything. He also commands his knights to take his father to the room that they prepared and that there is some cleaning to be done here. 
The knights agree to Cardriel's command and grab the king. As they are dragging him away to the room, the king shouts out to Cardriel that he's not going to last long. Once his father is gone, Cardriel mentions to one of the knights to honor the dead by holding a funeral for them. The knight understands his orders and agrees with Cardriel. We then fast forward to two weeks later and see what's happening in the Kratos Empire. We see that the emperor is crumpling a paper and is shouting at the nobles to tell Boyden to take Rigan's family to jail immediately, as well as his relatives, acquaintances, and guardians that he brought in. He adds to remove each one of them from their positions. Upon hearing this statement, the head butler requests the emperor to calm down as this is harmful to his health. However, the emperor doesn't listen to the head butler and instead smacks him with pieces of paper. One of the nobles then asks the emperor about what should they do with the investigation team. The emperor replies, What do you think? Summon them immediately. He also starts thinking about, he can't believe that the ledgers of the salt business were sent. The emperor further believes that there's no way that documents of this value weren't used as material for negotiation. As he presses his neck bad on his chair, he realizes that the fact that these were sent means that there was no negotiation in the South, which means that Roigar is involved. We further learn that the emperor had already expected Roigar to try and steal some of the Rigan salt. He disregarded it with the exception that he would be able to moderately handle the situation. But there is a limit to the emperor's tolerance for Roigar's actions. The emperor then states to the nobles that this is absurd. He adds that it wasn't a business dealing in textiles, silks, or grains, but rather salt. The emperor also starts to wonder about how, in addition to selling the final salt product, isn't Roigar aiming to acquire the entire raw salt industry as well? As he clenches his hand, he further questions the nobles about how dare he attempt to meddle in the affairs of the salt business and the succession to the throne of Amel. Suddenly, one of the nobles interrupts the emperor. He also apologizes for interfering at a time like this. Upon hearing this apology, the emperor asks him what now, and if he's intending to bother him about some trivial matter right now. The noble responds, How could I possibly consider doing such a thing? I intended to mention it from the beginning, as it has to do with Duke Regan. He paid the correct amount of tax, but the adjustments to the ledgers. I deeply apologize. All of the nobles sitting at the table are shocked and disappointed upon hearing this response. The noble then says, Numerous minor manufacturing facilities and warehouses were shut down. Instead, the data was manipulated to make it seem like output had grown at major factories. Duke Regan utilized his personal funds to supplement the reduced profits. This statement shocks the emperor. He also starts thinking about how there's no way that the manufacturing facility could have been closed and that it's impossible that this could have persisted for a minimum of five years. As the emperor clenches his hands, he further asks the noble about when did he find out about that and why is he only reporting it now? Upon hearing this question, the noble sincerely apologies to the emperor and states that it was a foolish mistake. The emperor questions the noble about who asked him to apologize and how long has he been aware of it. As the noble is sweating, he replies, I only recently learned about it. I became aware of this incident after the recent events, while I was conducting an investigation into Duke Regan's other businesses. I was unable to immediately notify you because, since it is true that Duke Regan replenished the state coffers with sincerity, I reasoned that perhaps he had a legitimate issue with his business and was using up his private assets without informing you. But if it's true that the salt industry has expanded to this extent, then this ledger... Upon hearing this response, the emperor tells him enough. He adds to just look into everything in the documents of the finance ministry and report back. As the emperor sighs, he further decides that he can have the secret police handle the rest. The emperor then waves his and shouts at all of the nobles to leave now. The nobles understand and start leaving the room. As they are leaving, another noble questions the blue-haired noble about if he's all right. As the blue-haired noble is chuckling, he apologizes to the other noble for displaying such an unsightly side of himself and that it was all his fault. He adds that his intention was to first check with Regan before informing the emperor. The other noble mentions to the blue-haired noble that he understands. He adds that a lot of things have happened recently. The blue-haired noble then states to the other noble that he should return to the finance ministry immediately 
and rectify the outdated ledgers and documents. Because the emperor did not provide a definitive order regarding the timing of any modifications. The blue-haired noble also starts thinking about how he will probably have to go over everything from the last 18 years. The other noble then tells the blue-haired noble that he will probably have to hurry and that he should get going. As the blue-haired noble is walking through the halls, he starts thinking about how nothing is working out. He believes that joining Lawrence's camp was his life-changing political event. He also is aware that even when he was establishing a private organization within the palace ministry and serving as Lawrence's secret agent, he utilized the Treasury's authority to covertly divert the National Treasury in order to secure the budget. We then learn that, however, Lawrence was demoted from his position. The blue-haired noble supplied information as instructed while Lawrence was under house arrest. Since then, Cedric has caught the blue-haired noble in the act. In the end, the blue-haired noble bartered his way out by turning over the list of everyone on Lawrence's side. However, the blue-haired noble believes that judging by the subsequent invitation to a dinner, it appears to him that Cedric does not have any intention of killing him. Now that the blue-haired noble thinks about it, he also believes that it must be a significant burden for the finance ministry since House Regan does not send up money from salt taxation. The blue-haired noble then starts to remember how he reassured Tia that there is no reason to be concerned since there are sufficient funds. However, Tia mentioned to him that it is not inherently challenging to reconcile the figures recorded in the ledger. She added that the situation will grow more challenging in a different way if the emperor gets involved. At that time, the blue-haired noble was confused upon hearing the statement. We are then back in the present, and as the blue-haired noble starts to feel chills, he starts thinking about how if he hadn't heard what Tia said at that moment, then he believes that someone other than himself might have revealed the issue with the ledger by now. Suddenly, someone asks the blue-haired noble about if he's returning to the Ministry of Finance. This makes him pause. The blue-haired noble then turns around and realizes that it's attendant Cobb. Cobbs then states to the blue-haired noble that it seems like he has some important business to take care of. Upon hearing this statement, the blue-haired noble starts thinking about how despite the fact that he serves as the head of secret agency and is the emperor's attendant, his status is unquestionably lower than his. He also couldn't believe that someone like him attempted to intimidate and threaten him. As the blue-haired noble clenches his hand, he is aware that Cobbs is the one who devised the plan to establish a network inside the secret agency and communicate with Lawrence while he was under house arrest. He further believes that Cobbs probably planned to put all of the blame on him. As the blue-haired noble takes a step closer to Cobbs, he decides that he won't let this happen. The blue-haired noble then tells Cobbs that the emperor will certainly let him know if he needs him. This statement makes Cobbs switch. The blue-haired noble adds that he revealed everything to the emperor and that there's no need for him to notify him. The blue-haired noble further starts to smirk and wonders about how even if Cobbs obtains the information first, what can he do besides sending a message to Lawrence? The blue-haired noble then turns around and starts thinking about how he can make that angry face all he wants. He also wonders if he thinks he would be scared because he found his weakness. Once the blue-haired noble sits down in his carriage, he further starts thinking about how it is now longer necessary for him to hold his head up high and that his actions were rather small in comparison to the recent incident. The blue-haired noble also believes that Tia is four times more terrifying. We then switch to the next scene where we see what's happening at House Riegan's villa in the capital. Inside the villa, the Riegans are shocked and are wondering what the knights are suddenly talking about to seize them. Meanwhile, the captain is shouting at his knights to arrest them all this instant. He also mentions to his knights to arrest the family members and take the head of the family to the interrogation room. He adds to place all children younger than five years old in a designated temporary daycare facility and to capture the servants as well. We further see one of the servants dashing in the villa and is thinking about how things have gone awry. He starts to remember Roygar and realizes that it was a mistake to see him back then. The servant also believes that if he gets caught like this, he'll die from torture. All of a sudden, someone grabs the servant's hand. The servant asks the knight what does he think he's doing. However, the knight ignores him and informs his comrades that they caught a servant who was trying to flee through the secret passage. As the servant is being arrested, he realizes that he's doomed. 
We then transition to the next scene where we see a lady outside in the rain and is begging the Empress to show mercy. She is also yelling and requesting her to spare her child. Meanwhile, her child is mentioning to his mother that they should go home. Upon the Empress noticing this, she creaks open her door. The lady also looks up. The Empress then starts to approach the lady with her lady-in-waitings. Once they are close enough to her, one of the ladies-in-waiting questions her about, for how much longer does she plan to cause such a ruckus? Upon hearing this question, the lady bows to the Empress states that as his daughter, she shall pay for her father's sins. She also requests the Empress to forgive her. The Empress asks the lady that she's neither a heir nor a proxy, so what right does she believe she has to take her father's place? She also questions her about if she genuinely believes that she would forgive her if she apologized again. The lady responds, I'm completely aware that this is a shameless plea. I will not dare to ask you to show mercy to me. This child is only six years old. Please, at the very least, save him. Please understand the sentiments of a mother. What did my child do to deserve this? Upon hearing this response, the Empress steps closer to the lady and tells her that the child hasn't done anything wrong. She also gives the lady an icy look and questions her about where were they all when her child died. Please make sure to subscribe. Special thanks to all of my Patreon members. Why not watch another manhole recap on my channel by clicking on this video right here?